Kyle Klingman with Track Wrestling. If wrestling changed your life, Ryan Warner wants to ask you about it. He is the host of the recently award-winning podcast, Wrestling Changed My Life. I believe it's the very first NWMA award for podcast of the year. Ryan Warner has that distinction. Ryan Warner, how are you? Outstanding. I'm honored to be here. And that's the first award the podcast has ever received. So thank you for, uh, for mentioning that. I appreciate it. Well, I appreciate what you did to recognize the Smith family. You have a podcast documentary called The Smiths. It's seven episodes. I am resentful that you had seven episodes because you made me binge it because it was that good. So I highly recommend it. Actually, more than highly. I think it's a must listen. But starting from the beginning, Ryan, how did this great opportunity to showcase one of the great legacies in all of sport fall on your plate oh it was uh it's it's looking back it's incredible how it all came together there was a gentleman by the name of pat christensen who listened to the documentary series i did on gable and he goes hey the national wrestling hall of fame is launching this series called etch and stone um would you want to tell some stories and I said, yeah, um, they go, which ones? And I said, hey, COVID just hit, let's do the Smiths. I know John's not coaching. Um, and John was a guy who was impossible for me to get a hold, a hold of up until this time. And I just, like you, grew up loving John Smith, um, had his shoes and I grew up an hour from Iowa City. So I had to keep it on the hush, but I grew up loving John Smith. And you know, when I got that call in April, I agreed to it and then, I was working on another project and then about end of June, I called them back up. I said, all right, let's do this. And I go, if you can just get John to commit, I can get all the other interviews and I can worry about that. And so John agreed to do an interview at the end of August and the end of September, two, two hour long interviews. And so all of July, I was researching, flew to Stillwater for the first time, the last week of July, interviewed Leroy and his wife, and then, uh, and Lisa Little, um, and then interviewed as many people as I could the first three weeks of August. And then finally, the last week of August, flew to Stillwater and sat down with John for the first time. And before it was all said and done, he agreed to a third interview. Um, we ended up talking to 30 people, you know, like 20 of them were in person. Um, and that was really the kind of the interview stage of it. And then October and November, I wrote the script. December, I revised the script, and then in January, I put it all together. So we were putting, I was putting the episodes together, sending them off to a buddy of mine, Raleigh Peterkin, to review them. He'd send back some changes. I'd send them back to the Hall of Fame, and then once they approved, they were locked. And so we just did one episode, like, every three to four days throughout January, and finally we had them. Was it just a mad rush to the finish? Was your life consumed by this for a period of time? hundred percent. Yeah, it was January, especially was, you know, I'm an early riser. So I, I got up at four 30 during the week, but every single day in January, I worked on this. Um, and I would work during the work week, four 30 to nine. And then from like two to eight. Um, and then on the weekends from like five to like noon and just all in on it, it was just, uh, and I, I was, super focused on it from December back to when it started. But January, once we agreed that it was going to go like February one, I was like, I have a lot of work to do. And so it was just all consumed. And I really feel like when you're writing or editing something, if you're not doing it every day, the characters start to disappear. So it actually helped to do that, but it was uh, not good for the social life um, <laughs> throughout January. Did you enjoy the entire process of putting this together? I did. There was a, there was a, three day period mid January where episode three, I was struggling with it. And it was, we were on day five of episode three. And I was thinking, there's just no way we're going to finish by February one, if it's taking this long. And then I started to panic a little bit. And it was like a two day period where it reminded me of wrestling, like the day before sectionals, when I start letting all the doubts come in or something, you know, and, you know, turned around episode three, and then episode four with Pat just really flowed. And then from there we were off. So there was like, like that three day period where it wasn't enjoyable. And I was like, I'd be sitting around 
at night with my girlfriend. And I'm like, why is my hand just clenched like this? I'm just gl- gripping the blanket. I'm like, I gotta take a breath here. Um, other than that, though, it was uh, just the, the best thing I've ever done in my professional life, hands down. When you have a documentary like this, a podcast documentary, there's so much that goes into it, not only from the interviews, but just some of the clips that you have and some of the audio, NBC footage to interviews, archival interviews. How did you get all those? A lot of it came from Rex Holt down in Stillwater, Oklahoma. He's, uh, he's been the voice of cowboy wrestling for you know, since the 70s. And he had a, lo- a lot of that was old Stillwater radio uh, archival broadcasts and you know they were don't you know let us use it and um the other ones you know we we found and you know had our lawyers work through all that process but you know got the stuff and you know it really just kind of centers around each episode what's the marquee event like what's the climax well we got to have something from that you know we got to have archival from that if we can find it um so that's kind of where it starts and then you you backtrack and you say, oh, I really love when John Smith snapped down Mark Trezino, the crowd goes crazy. So we want to put that in there. And you're just kind of looking for the most exciting moments or the moments with the most conflict and trying to center each episode around that. John Smith, six world and Olympic titles in a row. As Mm -hmm. most know, the closest any American has gotten is three in a row. From your vantage point and being around him and doing this, what sets John Smith apart from everyone else? He is, it's a couple of things. He's just the most ruthless competitor you'll ever meet in the sense that he doesn't allow feelings. He doesn't allow how he's feeling, how his partner's feeling. Nothing's going to deter his goal for that workout or that day. And I just don't think he ever negotiated with himself. I don't think he ever laid in bed and said, do I want to go that hard today? You know, he just never negotiated and when you have that kind of discipline that long, your confidence is just so high. Um, and I think that's a lot of it. People say he's the most confident wrestler, and he is, but it's only because he has been in this deep psychological state of like a warrior mentality for so long that how can you not feel confident? So he just never negotiated with himself. One of the best parts in the documentary series is when John talks about coming back from Cuba and losing to Lazaro Reynoso and just not blaming anyone, not blaming his practice partner. Uh, I felt like that was maybe the best insight that you can get into John Smith's head about that. What was it about that situation with Lazaro Reynoso that drove John to his next level? I think it was that, first of all, I couldn't agree more. I love that part. Um, I think it was that at that time, he admitted that he had already accomplished every goal he'd set in wrestling. And so he had nothing to strive for and that gave him something to strive for. You know, I don't, I don't think the highlight of 90 was winning the world championships. I think it was beating Reynoso at the grands later that December. And so that gave him a new goal. And I didn't put this in the documentary because it's too confusing for the non-wrestling fans, but he told me on tape after he got beat by Reynoso, his goals changed from winning anything he didn't want to, you know, he didn't care about winning the worlds, winning the Olympics. He wanted to go 36 and 0 in world Olympic competition, which meant, you know, going 6 and 0 in 90, 6 and 0 in 91, 6 and 0 in 92, you know, and winning those three tournaments. I wanted to put it in, but it was just kind of, we were going back and forth and it was too confusing, but really that loss changed his goal and gave him a new goal to strive for. I think that's why it was so impactful. And then, as we're doing episode five, knowing that at the end of episode six, Reynoso is going to come back is just, it was so exciting to make it like that. That's the question I had. Number one was because it's so detailed and there's such great information. How do you decide what gets in and what doesn't? Like, for example, I think uh, Kevin Darkus put a, a real thumping on John Smith his freshman year and, and used that as a, a turning point. How do you decide that that doesn't get in and maybe something else does? It's funny you say that because going into it, I thought we were going to focus in on Darkest more than Jim Jordan, mainly because the Jim Jordan, John Smith story had already been told. But when I asked John, he's like, point blank, Jim Jordan was a bigger turning point. So I think Darkest was left out only because it wasn't the turning point for John. Like he didn't change his attitude until Jim Jordan. 
And so when I was picking the events, it revolved around a couple of things. One, do we have archival footage of it? So that's why I left Sergey out as opposed to putting Reynoso in. You know, we have the match footage of Sergey, but there's no announcer. And so for an audio documentary, it's as if the match didn't happen. Um, so that was one where I was struggling. Do we do Sergey in the Grands or Lazaro in the Grands? And when you look at the impact of Lazaro and how much more woven that story is, that's why that one stuck. So it really came down to what's available footage wise to what's the impact on the John Smith story? You know, if you take Kevin Darkus out of John Smith's life, is he still the same guy? Maybe, um, maybe not. But if you take Lazaro out or Jim Jordan out, he's not the same guy. And so you try to you try to limit the amount of names you're putting into it because people like you and I know them, but most people don't. So you try not to bring in any new names unless it's absolutely critical to the story. And I try to just trim it back to so that anything that was included was absolutely mission critical. Um, I'm actually surprised I haven't gotten more flack for not focusing on any Bedlam duels as well as the Sergey match. I was really worried that people like you are like, dude, how do you not have Sergey on there? How do you not have that match? But I really just didn't feel like that was that big of a turning point for John because Sergey was so far out of his prime. Um, so those are a couple of reasons why. What do you get the feeling from doing all those interviews, how John views the, the Lazaro Reynoso matches? Do they still bother him? It does. He, he talked about, and I'm going to release a full interview, the Lazaro Reynoso loss at the 92 Olympics bothered John until 2008. <laughs> he said that uh, it just really, really bothered him for that long because one, his goal was 36 and 0. You know, he didn't get that done. So I know that one bothered him for a long, long, long time. And I can't re wait to release that raw interview just so people can hear. Because he says, you know, wrestlers, they're the worst that if your career doesn't end on top, it might ruin the rest of your life. You know, and even someone like John who won the 92 games, he still was plagued by a little bit of depression for up, upwards of 20 years, a um, little less than 20 years because he lost to Lazaro in that match, even though he knew he was going to the finals. So, you know, it bothered him. You do a great job of interweaving a lot of these storylines. And when you bring them all together in one, it does seem stranger than fiction that you have co-head coaches with Kenny Monday and John Smith, and he's trying to win a world title while being a head coach. And Pat Smith becomes a four-time NCAA champion despite all this. Alan Freed loses a year of eligibility. That particular year in that time frame, when you talk to those guys, do they have a little bit of resentment about how things went down for that forgotten season in 1993? I think they do in the sense that the forgotten season of 93 was bad, but what was really bad was 91 and 92 because both of those full seasons, 90 slash 91 and then 91 slash 92, those were also plagued by people transferring the distractions of the investigators of having Josie hold these secret meetings and chase guys down at their house. So it wasn't just the forgotten season. I think the forgotten year was probably more of a, a closure and everyone's agreeing. All right, this is the last year we're dealing with this. We're going to get through this year. Then we're fine. So there's resentment on just how long it lasted. And knowing that their arch rival, Iowa had, you know, some of the best teams of all time during that phase. I think that's more so the resentment than anything else. And just that looking back, it was such small potatoes to begin with. And then the lies compounded it. I think if people just would have been honest at the beginning, this wouldn't even have been a blip on the radar. What was Alan Freed's motivation to lose that year? Cause he could be in a unique space, possibly a four-time finalist, two-time NSA champion. Any idea why he decided to, you know, really not yeah. go that year in 93. I asked him point blank. I was, I flew out to his house in Ohio and I was sitting there with him and he's one of my favorite people in the world to talk to. Cause you always get a straight answer. He told me a lot of it had to do with Mark Perry because when he, cause he'd already been training with John and was, he went to Oklahoma state for John, but in terms of staying, he said it was Mark Perry because at the SWR worlds, which he won, either that summer or the summer before Mark was his coach. 
and he really just felt a strong connection to Mark and like the structure of him being a seven year veteran as an assistant coach at Nebraska. Um, that was one of the things he said. The other thing was, he's like, if I would have gone to Ohio state, which is where he was going to go, he's like, I would have been an outsider. I wouldn't have been a part of the team as much. And he's like, instead of, you know, being a four-time finalist, I got to win a team title, which is even rarer than being an, an individual champ, you know, for someone of that caliber. You dove right into it, episode one. You talk about the 1984 Olympic situation between Randy Lewis and Leroy Smith. I want to fast forward then to episode four. You use the language, uh, Leroy Smith was unjustly removed from the Olympic team. <laughs> if you ask Randy Lewis, he would say, I was unjustly uh, having to wrestle a match that I won. And he actually had to wrestle Ricky Delegata two days before the Olympic Games. How did you choose that word unjustly? Oh, man, I'm so glad you said that, because that's one where as I'm recording it, I'm trying to convey it from the point of view of the Smiths um, and to help people remember, hey, three episodes ago, something really bad happened. I'm just trying to kind of get the listener to remember, oh, yeah, from Leroy's point of view, he was unjustly removed. Um, in retrospect, if I if I consider myself a reporter versus a storyteller, I would say that probably shouldn't have been used, but I was just trying to tell the story from their point of view. And I got to tell you, I have interviewed Randy in person for this. I think, well, he wouldn't agree with that. He'd probably be really pissed at me for saying that. I do think that even the Smith family has admitted to me, some of them have looked at that initial match, that match two, and don't even agree that it should have been reverse in the first place sometimes, you know, so it's just such a, such a sensitive situation. Um, but that's why I used unjustly just to remind people that we're telling this from the Smith's point of view and to help them reflect back to that episode one controversy. Was that something you knew right away that you're going to dive into no matter what? Yeah, because it's one of the most important events in John's life. Uh, even to this day, he's very, you know, uh, closed about it, as you can tell from episode one. That was something that you can't even understand. To me, you can't understand the Iowa-Oklahoma State rivalry without that. And you can't understand John wrestling Randy Lewis in 88 without that. Um, the Tom Ryan-Pat Smith match and why Gable was so invested into it comes back to 84, you know. So, and then also the Goodwill Games in episode two. Gable's the coach and there's that's the first time they're kind of healing um I mean I don't think you could tell that story without going into that and at first Kyle I had that broken out as a separate episode but felt it was going off the rails too much so I tucked it in the back episode one but to me episode one was the most challenging because there were so many storylines whereas episodes two through seven were pretty straightforward once again you made it hard on me to to pick favorite spots because it was all outstanding but one of my favorites was the freshman season of Pat Smith going to Portland State and getting pinned by Dan Russell and how that all played out when you look back at that especially with how good true freshmen are doing right now and what he had to go through how did Pat get to that point where he's getting pinned by the D2 champ first match out all the way to dominating Dan Russell at the NCAA championships in 1990 I think it was he inherited this utter self-belief in himself that very few people, even his teammates at Kendall Cross, they say they just can't understand where that belief comes from. But to me, it comes from the fact that he was drilling with John when he was a high schooler, learning the low single when, you know, I, I said this in the doc, but the Russians couldn't stop it. How could high school wrestlers stop it? And so Pat had this confidence inherited from that. And, you know, once he got back from Oregon, back to the Oklahoma State room, you know, he's wrestling Barnes, he's wrestling Kenny Monday, and he's going with them, not beating them, but he's going with them. So I think there's a confidence that comes from that. And just the support he had around him. I mean, he just had, you know, his dad, his brother, they were just there for him and, and wanted him to do well. And so I think it was a confidence in himself, incredible workout partners, and then just the support cast of, of everything you need to be a champion and not that Dan Russell didn't have that. I just think it's, you know, Pat's one of the rarest wrestlers of all time, you know, for that, for that reason. Isn't that crazy though, that Dan Russell was a four-time champion D2 and that's Pat's first match. And he's the first four-time D1 champ. I couldn't believe it. 
Yeah, and again, there's so many layers to it. Once you just look at how this all plays out, and as you've even mentioned, how it evolved into the Mark Perry versus Johnny Hendricks, which was much later. There's just so many dynamics to this, and I'd have to assume at some level it hasn't stopped yet. There's probably more chapters to be written. Oh, I'm, I'm sure there is, and I think um, you used this word earlier, stranger than fiction. Sometimes I would like sit back after researching, and I'm like, is this possible that all of this happened, you know, one season after another, and it just lines up perfectly? You can't even write it like that. It's just unbelievable to me, um, especially how it comes to an end in '94. <laughs> the fact that in '93 they had a losing record, they weren't even at the NCAA's half the team almost transferred then the next year history's made with pat he's the ow oklahoma state beats iowa john's coach of the year mark wins his fourth state title leroy um you know was head coach at arizona state i mean just all these things were going so right for these guys at one time it's just incredible and then to know that john didn't win another one for like nine years is pretty crazy to me Every family has their own dynamics. How would you describe the dynamics of the Smith siblings? Just one of the most loving, supporting families I've ever been around. Um, you can't go in one of their houses without insisting that you have a meal or that you stay over. Um, I just, you leave any time with the Smiths, whether it was Chuck and Rita White and Broken Arrow or any of the siblings, you just leave feeling God, that is such a close family and just such a loving family that the reason they don't feel pressure is because the family really doesn't care if you win or lose. They're still going to love you. And they're so religious that they have this higher power that they answer to. And so the wins and losses, they mean a lot. But I just think that they don't feel that pressure to win as much because the family is so strong. Um, I mean, you think about this. The mom, as we know, Mrs. Smith didn't go to a lot of matches. And I think that kind of subconsciously said, hey, there's more to life than these matches. You know, whereas a lot of kids now, my mom included, they didn't miss a match. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I just think they had this perspective that, hey, it's not all about the wins and losses. Um, and that, again, comes from just the bond they have. They're so close. Leroy Smith Sr. comes across as maybe one of the, the great sports psychologists that never was tabbed as a sports psychologist. <laughs> Is that the feeling you got? Yeah, I mean, he is uh, wise beyond his years. And you talk about perspective. He is the most open and most willing to talk about what happened in 1984, even more than Gable, even more than Randy or even John or Pat, for that matter. And so he, um, he laid the groundwork. He laid the foundation. There would be no Smith dynasty without Leroy, hands down, in my opinion. How'd you decide you wanted to go into the podcasting storytelling space? Uh, it's a great, uh, great question. It goes back to I in the two thousand in the twenty tens. I became obsessed with the Joe Rogan podcast, and then I found the Tim Ferriss podcast. And then five years later, I'm like, my whole day, my workouts, my routines, all my opinions are really from these podcasts. And I just couldn't believe that this long form dialogue was out there, and that we really didn't know about it until you know early. I guess 2009, 2010. So my roommate in San Francisco, we would we decided to start a Tim Ferriss podcast for millennials. It was way too wide, but we were just interviewing CEOs and business people and loved it. And then I moved back to Chicago in this in the winter of 2018. Knew I wanted to keep doing a podcast, and then just started interviewing wrestlers. But really the so that's kind of the weekly show, you know, wrestling changed my life. We have episodes Monday and Wednesday where it's one-on-one -on -one interviews, but the audio doc that actually spawned from my girlfriend because she was, she's not a wrestling fan and doesn't really like podcasts, but she loves the serial podcasts and all those like true crime ones. And I'm like, man, there's a lot of people who like that. Why don't we do an audio doc for wrestling? Because I've also always loved ESPN 30 for 30s. And those are film documentaries, which are a lot more involved. And so it kind of just started there. And then Gable the Goat was the first audio doc I did. Um, didn't know anything about it. And then really started to learn the fundamentals of storytelling after that. And I started reading a lot of books on screenwriting, on the three-act structure, on how to find 
conflict and and motive within a story. And so a lot of time was spent reading books on script writing and screenwriting kind of to supplement the passion that I had for it. Do you want to keep evolving in this space? Are there other projects you have in mind? Yeah, absolutely. There's audio documentaries I know I'm going to do this year if the people let me. Um, there's, and I also want to do film documentaries too. I mean, my goal is to do an ESPN 30 for 30. Um, if it's on wrestling, great. If it's on some other story, great. I mean, that's my North Star. Whenever that happens, it'll happen. But a step to getting there is to step outside of the comfort zone of audio docs, which now I feel pretty good with and getting into film documentaries, which adds another layer of complexity, mainly because I'm my own crew. Like I'm a one man band when I go to these things. Sometimes my brother Tanner comes with me and that's awesome, but he has a job, so he can't always go. Um, so the next step would be, we're doing at least one more or two more audio documentaries this year. And I'd love to do a film documentary in 2021 as well. So we'll see. Do you feel like when you were young, you had some innate gifts to go into this lane? I think at a young age, I was always the kid who asked a lot of questions. And my aunt and uncle or whoever would say, God, this kid just asks questions over and over. And I was always hanging out with the adults. And so I just kind of, I think if anything, I have a knack for being able to get curious with anyone I'm talking to and just say, all right, what do, you, what do I think this person's interested in? Well, I think they're interested in this. Let's talk about it. And so just having a general curiosity and what whoever else you're talking to, what are they interested in? And that's what I try to talk about um, from a young age. And in my professional career, I'm in outside sales. And so, you know, I've been in that for six years. And so you think about maybe the 1200 meetings I've been in where you walk into a business room and they don't really want to see you until they know they can trust you. Um, as opposed to getting on a podcast with someone who uh, they know they want to talk to you, you know, it's a little bit less nerving. So I would say just between you know, my childhood of my mom encouraging me to be curious and me just, you know, always asking questions to a point of annoyance, uh, coupled with my, uh, my sales career, um, and then just a lot of reflection. I mean, I, I think about the structure of a conversation before any podcast, I really think it through in terms of the prep. Uh, I know you do as well, just by listening to how detailed you go. Um, I think that's something a lot of people don't understand is, you know, you don't want to have the questions written out, but you have to know the topics you're going to hit. Um, and I think the preparation is a huge, huge, huge piece of it. Finishing off with the Smiths, the audio documentary again, which I'm not just highly recommending. I'm saying this is a, a must listen, but outside of the Smith family, who was the most interesting character in that podcast from your vantage point? Oh man, Randy Lewis, Gable. I'm just kind of going by episode. So episode one, Gable, episode two, I really loved hearing from Corey Bays because that's a, you know, he had insight into John that we really never had as well as Jerry Hickman. I knew you'd appreciate Jerry just by knowing uh, how, uh, how close he was with John. I would say Dan Russell was fantastic. Um, I really liked Rex Holt. I really liked Willie Baker, the attorney, um, Mark Branch. It's just so hard to say, but you know, if you kind of go through it like that, um, and Mark Branch should have his own audio doc, no question. I mean, that guy is incredible. Um, those are a few to come to mind. And if I'm leaving someone out, I apologize because there's just so many that uh, thinking back on now. It just got released. Are you still buzzing from all this? Yeah, I, I'm uh, just floored and extremely grateful by the uh, by the reception of it. Um, you know, a lot of times when I was doing the audio doc, I'm like, I you know, I've been so into the Smiths for the past seven months that I just know and assume certain facts that other people might be lost on. And so I was hoping that it all made sense to a non-Oklahoma State fan and even to a non-wrestling fan. I think part of the goal when I do these is I'm not trying to be so in the weeds wrestling wise that folks outside the sport can enjoy them. And hopefully we get more people interested in wrestling because of them. 
It is called the Smiths Checkout Wrestling Change My Life. All you have to remember is that you can go into any number of platforms, Instagram, iTunes, you name it, you can find it. But Ryan Warner, congratulations on just a fantastic job with a, a family that deserves this kind of attention and this kind of recognition for what they've accomplished. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on here. And, you know, thanks to the entire, I'm just thinking of everyone involved, the Smith family, they, you know, they let me into their house. I stayed the night. Um, everyone at the Hall of Fame, Leroy Smith, Jack Carnifix, um, you know, Rich Bender at USA Wrestling, they were involved with this. Everyone involved, you know, my brother, Roly, Roly Petterkin, who wrestled at Penn, he helped me a lot in January with the consulting. I mean, just an incredible team effort to get it done. And I'm extremely grateful.